Welcome back. Yes, indeed. Uh, we're talking about the health sector. Yes, you know, we're grappling with uh, not just us, the world grappling with COVID-19 pandemic and making some, you know, uh, job of work of it because uh, the vaccines have been rolled out. We've received the tranche, the first tranche here in the country. We've seen some of those who have registered. And then while the country, the world was grappling with that, even Africa was grappling with COVID-19 pandemic, Ebola equally resurfaced, raising huge concerns in different parts of the country. Well, much as we know that um, the PTF did say a thing or two about it some time ago in terms of what they're doing, but you saw that on the floor of the House, Honorable Onyema Idem did raise some concerns about what he thinks we should be doing. In fact, he joins us this morning. He's the Deputy Chair, House Committee on Communications. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on the program. Well. It's um, more like a holistic thing uh, now, the health sector grappling with these outbreaks, uh, keep examining or raising questions about our capacity to handle some of these outbreaks. But if we could just start off from there, and then we'll come to some of the other details. Why did you raise that motion in the first place? Um, thank you, Chamberlain. Thank you for having me this morning. Um, the motion that um, came up yesterday on the floor of the House um, was um, necessitated by the current um, you know, pandemic that is ravaging the country. And I look at it that um, it would be nice that um, we have so many battles you know, to, to, to confront um, with at the moment. So that's why you know, the House, in its um, wisdom yesterday, um, um, passed that um, motion you know, mandating the federal government to be on the alert concerning the pandemic, sorry, concerning the, 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 the possible outbreak of um, Ebola. The whole essence was just for us to be alert, to be proactive, not to wait until when the sickness, um, you know, um, meet us in the country before we can now look for, you know, remedy. So the essence was just for us to be very proactive and then get prepared so that um, the sickness will not, um, you know, meet us unprepared. That was the essence. The way we are going about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, did you get enough confidence? Because there may be those who think that, okay, you may not have been satisfied with what you've seen regarding our handling of this COVID-19 outbreak because uh, I think the PTF did say, having seen the way we're going about this, we could, I think SGF said, they could write a book on how prepared or how they've handled this as a template, meaning that's a part on the back. Did you see from that same perspective? Um, thank you very much. I think um, at this point, the first thing that um, the federal government should do just like um, it was stated in the motion that uh, was passed yesterday by the House, is um, for federal government to set up um, what um, uh, we call um, Ebola um, Virus Disease uh, Incident Management Committee. That should be the first step uh, by the federal government because we are talking about uh, being proactive here. Um, just like I said yesterday that um, our current health institution has been overstretched so um, as it is, uh, I wouldn't want us to believe that um, the current um, facilities that we have can actually handle that. So we need to create more facilities and then um, get ready for um, the, the possible outbreak of this uh, Ebola. And just like I said, since uh, um, it has already happened in um, two African countries, that is um, Guinea and also um, uh, Congo, so there is a possibility that um, if um, something is not done urgently about it, um, um, people can just um, you know, bring into the country. You know that um, um, movement of people is something that you cannot control. It is inevitable that people move on daily basis, especially um, through our borders, our ports. So that's why we believe that um, no matter what we have done at the moment, Yes, we have tried as a country in terms of the way we are handling the current um, um, COVID-19. We have tried as a country, but I'm not sure that um, the, co the current um, measures that we have in place can actually handle 
the um, Ebola in case um, it happened. So that's why we now alerted the federal government yesterday that for me, first thing they should do, according to the resolution of the House, is for them to set up um, um, Ebola um, disease, uh, virus disease um, uh, incident management committee. And from there, uh, most things will be, uh, you know, can be done through that committee. That's what I'm looking at. So in, in other words, you considered how we're handling the current COVID-19 pandemic and perhaps the PTF's comments that they had activated port health services to be on alert. So, and then you were not satisfied with those measures, hence the need for you to come up with that motion. Is that right? That's what I'm talking about. I believe that um, there should be uh, more health workers that should be trained specifically to handle the Ebola, um, you know, case in case it happens. You know, the ones that we have are, um, at the moment is overstretched. We need to tell ourselves the truth. The one that we have at the moment has been overstretched. So I want to believe that uh, more health workers should be trained and more facilities should be created. That's what I'm looking at. And isolation centers should, should be created more to support the one that we have at the moment. I know that we have tried in the way that we are managing COVID-19, but um, can we really say that um, the current facilities can handle that? I, I won't say that. So um, the, the, the essence of the motion was to, you know, direct them or to alert them, you know, for them to create more centers in terms of isolation centers, in terms of um, health workers, trainings, you know, all those things is what uh, we are looking at so that um, if there is any possibility, um, we are not going to be taken on our ways. Well, um, you, what you are talking about, clearly, Honorable, falls within the purview of the NCDC, which uh, about two weeks ago put out a statement that they have already um, activated uh, a public advisory uh, and that they already have an existing multi-sectoral, national emergency viral hemorrhagic diseases working group. Uh, so while the NCDC is frontal about the pandemic we're dealing with, it is also not taking its eyes off the ball of this possible outbreak that you are talking about. So beyond the announcement and beyond the advisory, are you saying that we are ill-prepared given that we already have a template as far as Ebola disease is concerned. Come again. Are you saying that we are, we are inadequate? Our preparation for such an outbreak is inadequate, given that the, there is a working group from the NCDC and there are desks at the airports about this possibility that you are talking about. Are you saying we are ill-prepared despite all of that? Okay, I think um, what I'm trying to emphasize here is um, more facilities should be provided to support the existing one. That's what I'm talking about. The one that we have at the moment has been overstretched. The one we have at the moment has been overstretched. So I'm looking at a situation where more facilities can be created. That's what um, I'm talking about here. And also... The, 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 the health workers that we have that are managing the current COVID-19, um, the, num the, the number is not um, adequate. So um, I'm looking at, um, you know, federal government through its relevant um, health um, agencies for them to create more, to, to, to recruit and train more health workers so that um, in case of um, any emergency about uh, Ebola, um, we are not going to be, you know, um, you know, uh, met unprepared. So I'm looking at a situation where we can increase the numbers of um, centers. Um, the current um, numbers that we have in terms of isolation centers, uh, it, they are not adequate. So we need more. And also, when you look at um, uh, our, our point of um, uh, the ports of entry into the country, um, we should beef up more security, you know. And the test we are doing at the moment is for COVID-19. So we, we need to also make provision for uh, a, 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 the, the possible outbreak of Ebola. That's what I'm talking about. Some, some health workers should be sent for training 
specifically, specifically for Ebola, not for COVID-19. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, well, because some time back we had also taken up the authorities, especially the ministers of um, uh, health, about this. And, of course, they have talked about the fact that people have been trained and all of that. But perhaps the concern here also should be directed at the people who will have to mingle with other people from other parts of Nigeria. What kind of uh, advisory would you be advising uh, that we give to our people, especially concerning this matter? Because ultimately, it's about the people. Um, thank you very much. Let me say that um, the, diseases, the disease we are talking about right now is a bit different from um, the current one that, um, that is ravaging the country. Um, Ebola is different from um, the COVID-19. And then um, the measures might not really be exactly the same. So I, I think um, um, risk communication should be on any moment from now. By virtue of um, that uh, resolution from the House yesterday, um, Minister of Communication should um, intensify efforts in that area by you know, sensitizing the entire public about um, the do's and don'ts, you know, what we should do right now and what we shouldn't do. For instance, you know, eating um, you know, red meat, eat, sorry, eating uh, bush meat, uh, maybe that is not properly cooked. Um, those kind of information should be given to the public. I, I know that uh, frequent um, washing of hands is something that we've been practicing ever since uh, uh, um, COVID-19 came on board. But there are other things that we need to also do. We need to, you know, sensitize the public. We need to go to, uh, to the remote areas and then um, carry out what we call um, stakeholders engagement. And then um, we use the traditional means and um, also social media to ensure that um, people are aware that something like this um, is happening somewhere. And um, when you look at the proximity, Guinea and um, Congo is not too far, far away from this place. So I think um, risk communication is very important at this point. And then we need to also beef up um, security around um, our this thing, different um, uh, borders to really um, safeguard um, such um, this thing happening. That's um, what I would advise um, the country at this point. Right, so more isolation centers, more facilities, more personnel, more trainings, basically equals more funding. Uh, and I'm sure you appreciate that. So uh, this motion, does it factor in that? Because, I mean, as we have rightly said, we're faced with COVID-19 and trying to you know, improve capacity to handle that. So how does a motion tackle that area of more funding? Because... I mean, that's like the most vital uh, topic in this one. Well, um, um, for us um, at the National Assembly, I think uh, we have been very supportive ever since um, the outbreak of uh, COVID-19, you know, occurred um, in terms of um, the budgeting, uh, the budget uh, provision for health, health sector. So you can see that um, there, there has been a tremendous improvement compared to the past. Um, at the moment, um, the, con the country budget for health is about 7% compared to what has been happening in the previous year. So that is, um, you know, part of the support that we are giving, you know, at the level of um, National Assembly. And we are also willing, you know, to support um, the more in terms of um, funding if um, the current um, resources they have, you know, is not adequate. Um, they can always um, beckon on them, this thing. Uh, National Assembly to see how we can support the move. Because I know that um, all this one that we are saying now, all the measures that uh, we are stipulating, there is no way um, we can actually handle, you know, this issue without um, funding. Funding is very paramount at this point. But um, for now, I'm not sure there should really be issue with funding based on um, the current um, 20, 2021 budget uh, provision that we have made for health institution. But um, going forward, if there is a um, challenge in that area, I think um, the National Assembly will be willing and then um, will be ready to support um, the health sector um, the more. Uh, let me just take you back to what um, the, the, the Speaker of the House of Representatives um, has been doing in the recent time. Um, I don't know if you've been following the activities of the, the, the House when it comes to um, health sector. He has been having engagement, stakeholders engagement with all the, um, uh, almost all the health um, uh, workers in the country, you know, trying to see how uh, their welfare, you know, packages can be 
you know, improved so that um, they can give us the best. I think um, that engagement is still, um, is still on, it's ongoing. So um, we are ready and willing to support um, the, the, the health sector the more. Right. So, Honorable Dem, there's the content of the motion and there is the motion itself. And that's, that brings us to the question about just how effective, how binding, how much of an importance really does the federal government attach to motions? Because we've seen motions in the past calling for this and that and they just went and we didn't see anything. So, really, just how binding should this motion be or how binding is it? <clears throat> well, I would say that um, every motion that um, emanates from the House, it, um, it, uh, it, it's a law that uh, must be respected by, you know, all arms of government. And I would like to commend um, the federal government, um, you know, for their sensitivity to um, you know, motions, motion, the resolution from National Assembly. Uh, let me just give you an instance. I remember some months ago, when I took up a motion on the um, Federal Character Commission, um, I, I, when, I came on board, when we came on board, um, you know, the, the Nine Assembly, I discovered that the um, Federal Character Commission was not properly set up. Uh, it was only one commission that, that was, um, you know, uh, on that board as at that time. So we passed a similar resolution that was passed yesterday and then directing federal government to ensure that um, um, adequate numbers of um, commissioners were appointed. And then within 30 days, the federal government happened to that um, motion. So that is how far um, motions, you know, have um, played important role as far as um, the administration or governance of this country is concerned. So I want to believe that this particular one is going to follow suit because this one has to do with, um, you know, human lives. Uh, we shouldn't play, you know, politics with um, human lives. So with this motion of yesterday, uh, we are expecting that um, federal government through its uh, relevant um, agency, especially Minister of Health, uh, will not just allow the motion to go you know, unattended to. I want to believe that um, they will look into it as soon as um, the resolution itself gets to um, National Assembly. It is my belief that um, these measures that we stipulated you know, uh, in the motion that are going to um, you know, put them in place so that um, we don't have reason to experience another outbreak. We don't have reason to experience another pandemic. It's not good for the lives of the people that we are representing. It's not even good for our economy. So I think they will respect the motion. Honorable, I mean, motions are, you know, usually are supposed to be well intended. Uh, good to see that the authorities hearken to the uh, motions when they come up, but we, we, we get that point. But we also do know that uh, there have been several motions that were not heeded uh, by the authorities. I mean, only recent history. Remember that, that the National Assembly themselves, about uh, confirmation of EFCC chairman, for instance, the former one. But we also do know, it's been said several times, motions are advisory. They don't have force of law. Isn't that the case? Well, I would say that it depends on the content of the motion and if, how sorry, urgent resolutions. the motion is. Resolution, actually. To... Okay, resolution. Yeah. Okay, it still boils down to what I said earlier. Um, it depends on the, the nature of the resolution. It depends on the content. Like the one of yesterday, it was a matter of urgent public importance. It, 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 it was a resolution that um, should not really, you know, um, delay. It shouldn't, it, it shouldn't take much time uh, before the implementation. It is an urgent matter that's supposed to be looked into. So uh, it depends on the content. I want to believe that uh, when um, a resolution from the House, you know, is um, such that um, if something is not done immediately, that is going to affect the lives of the people. Um, federal government don't really waste time when it comes to implementation. But if they know that um, some resolutions are such that, um, uh, you know, they can stay, you know, pending when they just appraise it and see um, the, the, this thing, the, the benefits are the important. I think those are the ones that normally take some time. But for the type of that yesterday, I'm not sure it's going to take time because it has to do with the lives of the people that um, we are representing. And also remember that um, one of the primaries, um, um, responsibilities of government is to protect life. 
you know, of its citizenry. So I, I don't see what will be, you know, the, the, the benefit of the people that um, we, are, we, are, we are governing if um, such motion that um, is so sensitive because it has to do with the lives, you know, will be kept under the carpet. I, do, I don't see why um, the people should really appreciate um, us being there to represent them. Uh, so I'd like us to touch on the, the era we're in now, which is the era of COVID vaccines. We just took delivery uh, of the first, first tranche just a few days ago. And interestingly, 2.3 million Nigerians registered in the first 24 hours. And uh, you know, listening to the head of MPHCDA talking about strategic leaders, uh, how they would you know, go out to get these vaccines and the role they will play also in informing their constituencies about how to you know, receive this vaccine, vaccine hesitancy, which we have seen over time. But for you, you have spoken about Ebola, which you also referenced COVID-19. Are you part of those strategic leaders who will be you know, taking the vaccines? And just what kind of information are you giving your constituents about this vaccine? Well, um, I think um, the vaccine just um, arrived in the country a few days ago. And then um, we are still um, studying the situation. And then um, we have, um, you know, health um, committee in the National Assembly. So um, at the appropriate time, uh, we are going to sit back and then um, look at measures that we can use to ensure that um, people are well sensitized. So um, for now, I will reserve my comment on that because we have not really done, you know, anything about it. We are just um, studying, you know, the situation to know, um, you know, you know what, what, what is next after um, the receipt of um, the first batch of um, the vaccine. So let me not really comment on that. Let us just wait to be advised by um, um, our health committee in the house before we can now um, know the next line of action. Uh, Deputy Chairman, House Committee on Communications, thank you for your perspective this morning.